Hey there, content creators. Christopher here, and I'm very excited to have with me uh, someone whose channel I have watched, admired, and learned a lot from. He is a documentary producer. He is also a member of Fee.org and does Out of Frame for their YouTube channel. His latest video, Wonder Woman Got It Wrong, Did You? I found to be very impressive. His most recent documentary is Made in Mecca. I am very happy to welcome to the show Sean Malone. Sean, thank you so much for being on. It is quite a pleasure to have you. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm always happy to talk about this stuff. I, I kind of love that you have a channel where you're, you're talking about filmmakers and, and creation and art and stuff. It's pretty awesome. Thank you. Well, it's... Like I said, I've learned a lot from your channel. I think you have a lot of interesting insights. And the thing that attracts me to what you do the most is you both have a, a passion for entertainment and the arts, music. You are very good at analyzing and, and deriving meaning from different films and their stories. But you also relate it to economics, which to me is very important. I think a lot of filmmakers don't think about because they're generally wanting to create a beautiful visual, work with actors. They're, they're thinking purely on the artistic side. But for me, as an independent filmmaker, if I want to keep doing what I'm doing, I have to think in terms of the economy, opportunities in the economy. If, if one thing is tanking, I look for, hey, there's probably a way to uh, capitalize on that. Not to, now, that sounds ruthless, but <laughs> at, the, at the same time, it's... To me, I think it's important to think about because if you want to continue to make films, it's an expensive thing. So you got to make sure yeah. that you're captivating your audience, you're bringing in money, you're giving them value for money, which is a big part of business, show business, and the economy. Yeah. Uh, you stated, and I really, I think this is a great place to start, and I do want to talk about some of your videos, but you stated in one of your videos, um, I think you asked the question, when people say, what is the economy, your answer was, the economy is people. So I, I think that's a great place to start, especially in terms of, you know, for the film industry, the economy is the audience, right? Yeah, well, it's, yes, of course. But I, I think what's interesting to me about the, talking about the economy, and especially with artists, <laughs> is that artists, a lot of times, filmmakers, you know, um, painters, musicians, I, you know, I went to music school, I've got, I've got a couple music degrees, and, and I've learned video production, and, you know, working on sets and directing and producing and all that stuff, just in my, you know, in my career instead. But uh, but there's always been a sort of a running theme where where a lot of people, especially artists, tend to think of the economy as like money. They think of it, you know, bean counters and like people who are just obsessed with dollar signs and Wall Street and all that kind of stuff. But in reality, like what's really fascinating to me about economics as a as a field of study is why I work. I'm the creative director for Fee and and that's the foundation for economic education. And I, I've, I've been with Fee for a long time, and, I, and I've worked with them for much longer. I've worked with them, actually, the first job that I ever did for Fee, I did a contract. Uh, I had a contract with them to do a video in, like, 2009 or 2010, I think. So I've been, I've been around this arena for a long time, and I've been creative director since 2016. And what I'm passionate about with this is really understanding that the – what we call the economy is really just a label that we ascribe to the, the production and creation of goods and services, the trade and consumption of goods and services between people. It's just people making stuff, trading it with other people and consuming it. It's, it people overcomplicate it a lot. And, and when they overcomplicate it, I think they take it out of the realm of the human and into the realm of the sort of inhuman math, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. And to your point that like for a filmmaker, the economy is the audience. Sure. It's the audience. It's the financier. It's the people that you're working with. It's all of the people that you need to get together and, and bring into one place to voluntarily produce something that hopefully other people will, will enjoy. You know, and it's it's just like I said, people overcomplicate it a lot 
but it's really all of those trading interactions. It's it's you with skills in post production, or you know somebody else with skills as a grip, or a camera operator, or a gaffer, or you know a DP, or whatever. You know, like all of those people have their own goals and needs, and you know, convincing them to do something. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe maybe they'll work with you on your project just because they're your buddies, right? But honestly, most of these people are trying to make a living doing this, and it's actually really weird and rare and awesome that they are. I mean, you know, 100 years ago, the idea that you could make a living not on a farm or in a factory was pretty much unheard of. You know, only, only a small, small, tiny percentage of people could do that. Now, it's actually a lot better for most of us, and yet still, I feel like a lot of people are... Um, you know, kind of don't see the miracle in that. I I have to agree with you, and I, I I carry that attitude with me wherever I go, which I I think is is starting to earn me the reputation as one of the town eccentrics, because <laughs> I well you know seriously I I will make statements to I remember making a statement to a cashier one day because I was feeling uh, quite in awe of the supermarket that I shop in. It's a, one of those uh, HEB pluses, which here in Texas yeah. is, you know, a, a mega supermarket. And yeah. uh, I think I made, they asked me how I was doing and I said something to the effect, which I admit in hindsight was a bit eccentric. Uh, I'm feeling in awe of the abundance around me and they looked confused. And, you know, so it kind of started a conversation while I said, well, you know, and this this person was maybe I don't know seventeen eighteen years old. He said, "Well, you know, sure. even a hundred and fifty years ago, uh, starving to death was a, a real concern to most people, uh, even in our country, which is uh, one of the most prosperous in the world. And yet now, you can not only go to almost every other street corner and and find some form of food, but even." You know, I, I saw someone who was um, panhandling uh, on a corner, which is, is a bit more rare here in Texas than it is. And I used to live in California where it was all over the place. But yeah, um, it's, you know, even that person, you know, they had bags of food next to them that people, had, you know, they'd seen mm -hmm. them on the way into the market. They come out, they, yeah. you know, back 150 years ago, if you were starving, you were really starving you were in a bad way so yeah. yep. um and this is something that i tell filmmakers all the time um who say well you know i don't have the equipment to do this or yeah. that and i'm i'm saying like you know our cell phones are far more powerful yeah. and high resolution than the the first movie cameras and and quite honestly it, i i think one of the biggest miracles of filmmaking now is what we're seeing in this kind of uh new generation of uh, sorry about the barking. Uh, <laughs> the new generation of, of, uh, of filmmakers have all this equipment available to them. And now that Hollywood is kind of, I don't want to say com collapsing completely because I, I, got, <laughs> I got a little reamed for yeah. my video about Hollywood being dead and movies as we know them being over. But what I was saying in that video was essentially the the kind of monopoly that Hollywood had on entertainment for many years, and I used yeah. to live in Hollywood, and I'd know, you know, there were, if you wanted to make movies, it was pretty much the same thing for everybody. Yeah. Everyone was looking for a way to get behind the velvet rope. Now, um, and my audience is used to that barking, so, <laughs> and it doesn't come <laughs> through too loud on, on the actual recording. Um, but now there's independent studios popping up everywhere in other countries and um they are they are working with less but that's making them more creative and the video on demand market is evolving how we tell stories as well so um do you, i have my own predictions uh as to what i think is going to happen with that have you have you kind of speculated in your own mind what we may see in the next couple of years I, I haven't done a ton of speculation, to be honest, because I think a lot of what's going on with COVID in particular is it's very, very strange. And I it's it's a very tumultuous moment. And I'm not really sure where things are going to shake out. Now, there are there are a handful of things that feel 
increasing, I guess I will say increasingly likely the longer things go on, right? Mm -hmm. Like I was very, very worried early on and I've got, you know, out of frame episodes to sort of prove this is I was really worried about the the theater industry pretty early. You know, I, I think the theater industry was, was one that I think was, um, I mean, f- first of all, you know, I, f- I forget what the, gosh, it, it's been too long since I looked at the research here, but th- it's a pretty sizable percentage of Americans that hadn't even been to a single movie in the last year. And it's like under half or maybe even under like 20% who've been to the movies like more than once a month, right? It's very, very small percentage of people who are actually going to the movies regularly. And so that was already true. Um, and yet movie theaters had had survived because they have big tentpole projects and they, they bring in a lot of uh, people, you know, once or twice a year for, you know, like Avengers Endgame and stuff like that. Right. And because they, their model allows them to, you know, have sort of a captive audience for, you know, for concessions and all that, those kinds of things. And that's, that's all fine. It's just that in a world where, um, you know, first of all, the government shuts you down, does not allow you to do business. And then the longer that goes on, the more people are freaked out about it and just voluntarily not wanting to go, you know, because they're, they're worried about being around other people or whatever, you know, a live entertainment business, which is effectively what it is, right? Like the entertainment on stage isn't, isn't live, but the audience is live. Right. And, um, you know, it's just, so it's the same thing as running a, a concert venue or running an arena or whatever. I mean, you're, you're just, you're not working, you know, and the longer that goes on, the more the, the little cracks in those models are going to become really, really big problems. And of course they have been because, you know, um, you, you've seen what, what AMC and Regal ha- have had to do. I mean, Regal, uh, Cinemark just, uh, you know, laid off or, or just fire. Well, yeah, I guess laid off. Like, was it 47,000 people worldwide somewhere in there? I mean, 25,000 Regal employees across the United States. Um, you know, it's, it's bad for that. And then to the, to the extent that you want to talk about um, the movies, the way movies themselves are produced, that I'm, I'm a little less... Uh, certain about because I I do think that the distribution model is changing, but I I still wonder, I think the demand is still going to be there for big, huge blockbuster kinds of, of uh, movies. You know, I think Avengers Endgame is not the last giant, you know, billion dollar box office kind of movie, right? I mean, it's going to change whatever, however we define box office is definitely going to change. But I don't think that studios like Disney or Marvel or Warner Brothers, whoever, I don't think they're going to stop trying to tell huge, big, visually epic stories. I mean, Michael Bay alone is not going to let you do that, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, Christopher Nolan even. I mean, Christopher Nolan holds out on, uh, you know, on getting people to the theater. I don't know how long he can do that. I guarantee you Michael Bay doesn't care. He just wants wants people to see his movies. Well, Michael Bay it, got it, a, a, a straight to Netflix movie. He he seemed to do fine with that. What was that? Uh, I forgot what it's called. Six Six Underground. Yeah. Oh my god, movie. I watched I I watched that movie. That movie was so bad. <laughs> was but it yes. Yes, he did. He went right to But again, I don't think my that's my point, right? I don't think Michael Bay cares what uh, what the distribution mechanism is. He wants to make big, big movies. And Netflix wants Michael Bay to make big, big movies. You know, he wants, he wants people to, uh, to see them. Netflix wants people to see them. I, I don't think that part of it's going to change necessarily, but I do, I do wonder what the, what um, using economics in a, in a slightly more specified term, you know, sense here. But I mean, I wonder what the economics of, uh, you know, of the blockbuster are in a Netflix world, right? Like I, Netflix has thrown a w- around some really, really big budgets in the past. Literally um, billions have been spent on uh, yep. acquisitions or or funding original content. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But, you know, you wonder for a business model that's always teetering on the edge of, of uh, insolvency, it just makes you wonder like how they'll be able to do that. Now, at the same time, I don't actually know to what extent Netflix accounting is comparable to like major film studio accounting, which is also always teetering on the edge of insolvency. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't know, but you know, but I do think that there is demand for, 
for, I mean, I certainly, I'm in that category. I want to see big spectacle movies. You know, I, I want to see that kind of stuff. I love that kind of stuff. I, I don't always like Michael Bay, but I mean, I, I went to see Tenet. I would go see Tenet again. You know, I mean, like stuff like that is, uh, I think it's always going to have a place somewhere. Um, but it's changing because, you know, and it, and it gets to the abundance that we, that you mentioned earlier too, is like, um, it's not just food, right? Like we have access to 55 inch flat screen, 4k televisions that, you know, that connect to the internet and stream whatever you want, anytime you want. And you can get one of those for 400 bucks. I you can know? go down. Yeah. I can drive 10 minutes to target and, and they're there. They're yeah. ready to go. Uh, you just plug it in and, and they make it so easy and, and intuitive for you. And I think that perspective is so important because I mean, I'm not, I, I don't know. I say, I was like, I'm not that old. I'm 37 now. I'm, I'm getting older, but, <laughs> but like, which I feel like you have those moments, right? Where you're like, I'm 30. No, I'm not 30 anymore. Holy cow. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but no, I mean, look, when I was a kid, um, the TV in my house, my, we had one TV. I mean, th I don't think this was that abnormal, right? Like we had one TV. It was quote unquote, a big screen TV. Like by the time I was in high school, we had like a big screen TV and it was a CRT TV that weighed, you know, a hundred pounds. And I think the screen diagonal was like maybe 42 inches, probably max. Yeah. It was a big deal for back then. Yeah, for sure. You no know, huge deal, right. To have a TV that big. And now, you know, again, 55, 60, 70 inch TV, no problem. And more importantly, the definition is amazing, right? Like the resolution is incredible. Um, the the stuff you can do is incredible. It's just so much better now of a viewing experience than watching, you know, college football run from an antenna onto a relatively small screen. It's just not the same experience that I had when I was a kid. And I, I think it's funny because I, I maintain that in, my, in the back of my mind, like that's where we came from literally about 25 years ago. It was funny. You know? um, my wife, when they uh, canceled the Olympics, they played, they did uh, replays of Olympics through the year. And my younger daughter was watching it because she was into the gymnastics and she's going, why does the picture look like that? It's like, well, it's the eighties. <laughs> like, that's what yeah. the picture looked like. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, that's the thing. Like you look at, at broadcast TV, I mean, gosh, you go try to watch even an old movie, especially one that hasn't been like really, really painstakingly restored, you know, mm -hmm. and it's tough. Like the, <laughs> the digitization process or any kind of like, um, you know, conversion process from film in the fifties to what it is now. I mean, it's, it's so different. And, you know, and the eighties, especially, I mean, you look at TV and it's, it's the first sort of time where we're, we're getting digital cameras, and, you know, and they're digital cameras that cost the studios like $200,000 a piece and they're garbage, right? Utter garbage. And yet, you know, that was, that was our life then. And if you were to go back in time with a few cell phones and hand them and say, here, shoot on these, they would be ecstatic. Oh, they would, I know. you know, they're like, Hey, do like, how do we, their one problem may be like, how do we get lenses on these things that, you know, for the <laughs> right. And now, no, so, I mean, you think about, so you think about uh, like Citizen Kane, I mean, Citizen Kane comes up in film school a lot, you know, for, for good reason, but Citizen Kane broke all this ground in filmmaking in particular in film production and in camera techniques. Right. And one of the reasons that it broke that ground or had to break that ground, if you think about the opening shot of Citizen Kane, it's basically uh, you know, a dolly shot on a track that goes through a series of foreground objects like the gate and then, you know, another gate and then the, the window of the, of the house and all this stuff gets to Charles Foster Kane's, you know, bedroom or whatever. Like what Orson Welles had to do to make that possible is ludicrous, right? Like he had to literally build sets that he could break apart and have essentially teamsters on either side pulling sets apart as the camera, which is on, you know, a track gets, uh, you know, shoved through this whole thing by his key grip or whoever. I mean, it to do it was a massive undertaking, which is why it, it was so groundbreaking. But imagine doing that shot today, like I, premiumbeat.com just sent me a, a like a, 
a tutorial video a couple days ago, just, you know, in one of their, their, you know, emails that was like, here's how to do a, a portal effect going from like one location to another with like a nice little like matted, uh, you know, text thing in the middle or whatever. It's like how to, how to send the camera through your portal into another dimension. <laughs> and you can do it in After Effects and it would take you about, I mean, the tutorial itself was about 12 minutes, you know? I mean, like what you can do today versus what you had to do, you know, I mean, I'm talking about a hundred years ago, but let's even talk 20 years ago. Right. It's so dramatically different. Well, not only that, what surprises me is how often when I'm, uh, cause like I said, I, I create super low budget productions myself and what surprises me is how many people you propose stuff to and they go, oh, that's really ambitious. And then you go, well, not really. People are doing it on TikTok and Instagram all the time. Like, you know, look, yeah. look at this and, and you show them and they go, oh, and then they want to do exactly that. And then you have to explain, no, they did that thing, but we can take that same technique and we can create this other thing. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. All these opportunities I'm noticing are kind of, we're st uh, people are still hung up kind of on trends. Somebody comes up with an idea of how to utilize one of these bits of technology and then everyone's doing that. And it almost mm -hmm. seems like with the more expansion of technology and, and um, easy access to uh, open source software, I mean, that's the most amazing thing to me is, is how the market is yeah mo being moved by open source technology which i want to talk mm -hmm. to a little bit as well but everyone still seems to kind of be beholden to old ways of doing things and i feel like yeah hollywood is suffering from that a little bit right now i think think there's a lot of opportunities yeah. that hollywood if they were to go even mid-budget they could still create spectacle movies mm -hmm. uh they don't have to go because i know they lost a ton of money um during yeah. the covid pandemic and yeah. now i see video on demand is and like i said in some of my other videos you know movies and television have always been beholden to time slots video on demand is going i think people are starting to learn yeah. that that's not the case and we can do these very low budget productions with high quality equipment i mean i'm i'm using right. my uh, black magic pocket cinema camera which is sure. cheaper yeah. than a lot of dslrs and creates cinema quality footage I, yep. I can have access to um, Blender for 3D and some compositing. Mm -hmm. I can have access to, um, right now, my first feature film, The Quantum Terror, is uh, we're going through quality control, and I'm learning that a lot of stuff that you used to have to go to a, a QC house for to get everything checked and, and fixed so it could go to video on demand or go into a theater. There are open source programs that you can plug it into and with a little finagling mm -hmm. and a few tutorials, you can do that yourself now for free where it would have cost thousands of dollars. Yeah. So I see a huge opening for independent filmmakers post COVID while Hollywood is, and I, I don't wanna say like, it's like, you know, while Hollywood's wrestling a shark over here, we can swim free. Because uh, it sounds like I'm, I, I swear yeah. to God, I'm not saying burn Hollywood burn. And I know some of my listeners in the comments do go well, like, yeah, I, I, I have, I have some commenters who feel that way for sure. Yeah. You know, and, but what I am saying is that right now, uh, I, I have, um, I have connections to people who are, um, you know, do distribution coaching and, uh, that yeah. sort of thing. And, because video on demand is everyone knew video on demand existed but now they're discovering it because they had they had no other place to turn to for their entertainment and they're realizing there's old stuff on there they love there's new stuff on there that's that can take chances and it's can be done on a low budget and the video on demand platforms their main thing is they have to keep con they want people streaming content as much as possible which is why you're seeing five minute shorts now you know they want you streaming on your 15 minute break they want you streaming right. after right. you get off work anytime they can get you streaming but because hollywood's kind of holding out seeing what's happening they're holding their tentpole movies back another year uh yeah the, the dis the video on demand companies and anyone else who's distributing they are buying up 
anything that's ready, anything that they yep. can find, as long as it's yep. of a certain quality, and that quality is not um, <sighs> is not hard to achieve. So, what yeah, I, I mean, I, I actually had I had a handful of ideas early in this. I, mean, I I don't have time to do anything beyond what I'm already doing. I'm, I manage a big team and. And I, you know, and effectively am a YouTuber simultaneously to that. So I manage a creative team. Plus I do, you know, write and produce all the out of frame episodes. So it's a lot. It is a lot. But, and, and I do want to talk about those <laughs> soon. So, we'll, but we'll put a pin in that. Yeah. Yeah. But all I'm saying is, is like, I had, I had a bunch of ideas early in this where I was like, man, what? Cause my brain went, and, and I think we should talk about this too. Like really, if you think about what, what allows you to succeed in any market, I, people get really, uh, really weird about markets. Again, I think people overcomplicate this stuff is it, it comes down to value creation. What can you do that makes someone else's life marginally better in some way? Right. Mm -hmm. And, and the more you can figure out ways to use your skills and your passions and everything that you have to offer to add value to somebody else's life, the more you've got a marketable skill that you can then turn around and, and trade with people, you know, obviously for money, but you know, for ultimately whatever you want, right. For a better life. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, my brain from an entrepreneurial standpoint always kind of goes, goes nuts whenever there's some really big shakeup. So I just started having tons of ideas thinking like, okay, so we're all stuck inside. We're all isolated. We're not able to do this. Like what are the kinds of movies you could make right now on ten thousand dollars, let's say, you know, mm -hmm. or even a hundred thousand dollars, whatever. But like, what could you make that was like a horror movie about isolation? That that is like one single actor the entire time, like in you know in a in a creepy space or something like like that. Or or what you know what small scene like a drama movie, something like you know I didn't. Uh, this is sort of an example of what I'm talking about. But even something small like Marriage Story or something like that, where it's a small cast and maybe two or three people, you don't need a lot of actors to do it. And I think if you're creative, you can start thinking that way. And then even in really, really difficult times, you can come up with ideas that could turn into productions that would, that would work, you know? Yeah. Um, but I don't think, I think Hollywood's been, I mean, in the big picture sense, I think Hollywood big, you know, let's say, you know, the majors, right. right. And the mini and the mini majors have been, they've been sitting on, you know, 150, $200 million films for a year. And they are, they are, you're right. They, I mean, they're kind of wrestling a shark. They're hemorrhaging money because they don't know what to do. They, they, they've got all of this money outlaid in these movies and in marketing campaigns that are now useless, right? You can go through the, the target or whatever Walmart now and look at toys from movies that literally aren't coming out for a year. Right. Yeah. You know, it's, it's heartbreaking in a lot of ways because it's like, oh man, you know, people work so hard on this. Well, they did, and, and uh, that's that's a that's a big you know. part of it. Is you know, this there are people who I, I've worked on Hollywood sets, and there are movies you work on where they're like, it's just a job. But there are movies that people work on, and they're like, I'm excited to be a part of this, and I I can't wait yeah. to take my family to 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 show them what I worked on. So absolutely, yeah. Well, that's always the big question. Like uh, when, you know, I, I have, I've never, uh, mostly because I wanted to work for myself <laughs> more than anything, Amen to but, that. <laughs> I, I, but I, you know, I, I was, uh, I moved to Los Angeles in 2007, end of 2007, beginning of 2008 after uh, graduate school. And it, I went to graduate school for music uh, composition for film and with sort of the intent of going to become a film composer, but I kind of realized fairly quickly that it would probably be like a 10, you know, if I was lucky, let's say a 10 year grind before I could start working on really big projects that I was excited about. Mm -hmm. And I, that didn't really appeal to me. So I started making my own stuff and it, it happened to be right about the right time. You know, it happened to be like, you, the very, very beginning of YouTube, right? The first two, three years of YouTube. And the, the fact is that we started having DSLRs and we started having, um, you know, cameras that were like did good digital cameras that were starting to become affordable. You know, even I had buddies who had like red epics and stuff like that. But even those were, you know, $10,000 and not eighty. dollars Right. And probably shooting below the quality of the, the Black Magic Pocket Cinema camera that does now. A hundred percent. Right. 
but so so stuff like that just started to become a thing and i was already you know i'd already known how to edit a little bit because I, I'd done some of that work. I, I was a, when I was in college, I worked for a video production company for a little bit. And then I worked as a producer for a, basically a distance learning group at my college. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so I, I'd, I'd already been fairly familiar with video editing, a little bit of, uh, you know, motion graphics work, stuff like that. And just getting back into it and just teaching myself more, teaching myself illustrator, after effects, you know, all that kind of stuff was not too hard. But again, back to that perspective issue. I mean, the fact that I could sit in my, you know, West Hollywood apartment and learn um, Adobe Illustrator for basically no money, you know, mm -hmm. um, and learn new, a new skill that has that has become invaluable to the rest of my I mean, this this was you know, 12, 13 years ago, and it's been utterly essential to my entire career ever since, you know, and I, and I didn't need to go back to school for it. I didn't need to pay thousands of dollars for, I just needed YouTube tutorials, you know? Well, my, my awesome. whole film career started with YouTube and a, uh, discovering that my little digital eight pixel camera shot uh, about 10 minutes of video. And that <laughs> there was such a thing as Windows Movie Maker. Um, I, don't, yeah. I don't even know if that exists anymore. I haven't checked my Windows because I have uh, professional editing software now. But uh, I don't think it does actually. I think I think it died. But the the idea that I could I could lay in um, a B roll while uh, having an audio track play over it for interviewing people was astounding to me. And then After Effects was a revelation. And it was kind of the same thing. You got all these kind of jaded After Effects artists going, oh yeah, I can do this or that, no problem. That's kind of After Effects-y. But I'm thinking, general audiences don't know After Effects. They, they're not yeah. jaded about it. You can, as long as you have a good story that flows, and some of this, maybe some of the stuff you're doing is a bit janky, but if the story's compelling, they'll forgive yeah. a lot. I mean, how many yeah. how many classic movies can you point to a janky special effect and people shrug and just go, well, that's just kind of the, the look of the time, you know, no problem. <laughs> you know, it's funny too. I, I, I just watched uh, the shining last night mm -hmm. and, and where, where Kubrick, so I'm not actually, I'm not a massive Kubrick fan. Um, I know that's probably heresy for a lot of, a lot of filmmakers, but um, <laughs> I, I don't love Stanley Kubrick. Where I will give Stan Stanley Kubrick is an incredible, like, I mean, there's a lot of things that he was really good at. He was also a monster. So there's, there's that, but like he, he used cameras in really, really interesting ways. So like, I, I, I couldn't, you know, there are certain things, especially in the shining where you look at like the, the shot of Danny in, in the, like the little tricycle right, ro yeah. rolling around the hotel and the camera is tracking that whole thing from behind him. And it's, that those shots are amazing, and there's there's nothing that's better than that. I mean, they're they're just spectacular shots. At the same time, there there's a lot of stuff in that movie from an editing standpoint that I find really weird. Like, there's a ton of fades. There's a ton of, ton of crossfades in that movie. Right. And and some of them happen within very short succession. So there's like a fade, and then maybe thirty seconds later, there's another dissolve into into something else, and I personally, as an editor, I hate it. Like, I really do not like that because like, again, sort of you're conveying the passage of time. Like there's, there's a, there's a meaning to a dissolve that if you're telling me that more time is passing and it's only been 30 seconds since the last long stretch of time passed, like we're, we're in a weird territory editing wise. And I, I didn't like it at all, but like those kinds of things, um, I, I am actually making your point here, by the way, like, but the, <laughs> the movie, the movie overall is so masterfully written and told and acted and everything else that like those little things that kind of bother me from an editing standpoint, just as, as somebody who has opinions on style in editing, mm -hmm. um, they don't matter, you know, because because the the overall construction of the story is phenomenal, and I, I think that people miss that sometimes on their their shorts and stuff like that. Like when you you make a student film or you make a short film, sometimes people focus on um, 
I guess for lack of a better way to, to say this, sort of theatrics, right? Like like doing trying to do like the coolest effect or do, you know, some tricky thing, you know, virtuosic stuff. And it's this the same problem you see with like younger composers and musicians. Right. Trying to do really, really virtuosic stuff and then missing the fundamentals, like missing missing good pacing or missing good story construction structure, you know. It's like uh, skipping over those things to do like the really, really cool shot. Right. Yeah. It's kind of like uh, everyone's trying to uh, be the Harlem Globetrotters, but, you know, no one's trying to be the Lakers sort of. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Actually, I think that's a good I'm not much of a sports guy, but I feel like that's a good analogy. <laughs> I mean, like like it's it's cool that you can spin a basketball, but like, wouldn't it be better if you had a really well functioning team that was winning championships year after year like exactly well i want to go back i want to go back for a moment to what we were talking about you mentioned you know your your brain goes to trying to think of uh you know minimal cast quarantine films and i actually yeah. entered and i'm still a little salty that i didn't even place uh in the roger corman short film challenge quarantine short film <laughs> challenge, if you heard about that I didn't, but I I would like to see it. That well, sounds awesome. I I absolutely uh, adore Roger Corman as a businessman and also as an exploitation filmmaker. And, Agreed. And, and I accounts. I do love now. To me, you know, exploitation kind of comes with certain connotations these days because everyone thinks of Grindhouse, but essentially exploitation just means you know you're your hook, your promise, and you're going to deliver a lot of it. So exploitation could be babes, yeah. it could be gore and violence, it could be monsters, yeah. it could be, you know, Harley Davidson motorcycle gangs, you know, what, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the, the exploitation yeah. angle. And I always have loved about expo the spirit of exploitation. And this doesn't mean I love all exploitation films. I'm not going to sure. like sub submit myself to watching like hour after hour of really terrible exploitation films because there are a lot of them out there but yeah i love the well, they were <laughs> yeah exactly but sometimes you would get some really great ones um i do yeah. have my guilty pleasure is 1980s roger corman science fiction and barbarian movies personally um but i love sure th that roger corman kind of put out this call of you know he had th his rules were you know, do it in your home. Don't bring in a cast because we want you to social distance and blah, blah, blah. All these kind of rules that, um, you know, ensure that people weren't trying. Oh, and you had to shoot it on your cell phone. That was the other thing. It had to be shot okay. on a cell phone. So um, yeah. I, I cast my two dogs and myself in the role and i and i use some uh, low budget special effects tricks practical effects are a big favorite of mine so i made some tentacle mechanisms and essentially did a a <laughs> what happens when a mad scientist has to work from home story and it was comedic uh and, and it was good i'm so mad i didn't place anyway so the point is though i i do think that there are a lot of people who are going to independently take the opportunity to produce yeah. movies like yeah. this i'm one of them i'm already planning um yeah. a bunch like i've got a whole list like i I've, i'm slated for the next five years based on what we're talking about here um yeah and i believe that they can be done for a maximum of twenty five thousand dollars now one of the things i'm see do you follow the comic book industry at all per chance a little bit yeah yeah i i'm a, i'm actually a pretty big uh reader or i normally am but at, i don't um I have periods where I, I can't, I just can't take the time okay. to it. So I, I have not been like following like this year's version of whatever nonsense drama is going on, but I'm, I'm, I'm well up to speed in general. Okay. Well, the, the reason I bring it up is because I think that there's the independent comic book creators are doing something that I believe the independent filmmakers should think about modeling. Now the old okay. model for, um, Hollywood in general is essentially, and this is something people have been complaining about, you know, is they want to make movies that appeal to the widest possible audience, which expands into regions like China and Europe. And, and mm -hmm. the problem with that is, is that, you know, obviously different cultures have different interests. And there's that old axiom of, um, 
if you try making a movie for everybody, you end up making a movie for nobody. Yeah, yeah. And what I believe independent filmmakers should be thinking about is not only they say in general, know your audience, you know, know, know who your mm-hmm. target audience is as an independent filmmaker. But I believe that we should stop trying to cater to other countries unless we have a passion for a style of filmmaking from one of those countries, in which case, yes, absolutely cater to that country. But don't try and be so broad brush. What the comic book yeah. creators are doing, like I imagine this, if I can make a movie for $25,000 or less and make it of some quality with a minimal cast and I have some talent for special effects and I yeah. think I'm a fairly decent writer, um, not great, but competent. Uh, and then uh, I can engage a specific audience, maybe a thousand true fans. I'm, I don't know if you've heard of the 1,000 true fans uh, approach. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, I have. Okay. So for anyone listening that isn't familiar with that, the idea is essentially you get 1,000 true fans who hardcore, are hard, but yeah. Yeah, hardcore fans who are willing to spend $100 annually on what you do. That makes a six-figure salary. Um, so if you're making movies for $25,000 or less – and you have this, uh, these true fans. And then here's the other mistake. I won't, I won't say it's a mistake, but what I see a lot of independent filmmakers doing is they want to get that distribution deal because they feel it's going to get them on Netflix or whatever mm-hmm. platform. But then they end up being in the hands of someone else. They lose control of what happens to their film and the chances of them seeing any return from it, especially if they've got investors, yeah. is next to zero. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I think that a lot of that, though, is it, it's another sort of holdover from the old old studio model to a large extent. Because honestly, like if you think about the way if you were lucky enough to get picked up and the distributed by, let's say, Lionsgate, something like that. Right. Mm-hmm. Your first movie you will have made because you you made that first. Let, let's use like uh, I, I just said Lionsgate, but let's go to Miramax instead and use Clerks as an example. OK, right? So Kevin Smith spent, you know, famously spent like 25 grand or whatever making clerks, right? Entirely. It's all on credit, you know, his credit cards, uh, family, all that kind of stuff, right? right? Kevin Smith probably made almost no money whatsoever, even with the sale of clerks to Miramax, right? Probably not very much. But what he did do was uh, solidify his position as a go-to Miramax filmmaker. Right. Mm -hmm. So that got him the ability to make, you know, uh, everything else that he's made, Chasing Amy and, you know, uh, Mallrats and all the other stuff. Dogma. Yeah. Dogma. Yeah. And so that's great. But it's a it's a model that is sort of it's kind of a a winning the lottery kind of model. Right. It's not like a uh, every year I'm going to make X amount, you know, as a filmmaker. It essentially amounts to um, banking on one day I'm going to be a famous rock star. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And so I think what you're talking about, what's what's interesting about it is it would allow more people to sort of grind and do have like a really comfortable living at some point, but not at maybe not being a rock star, right? Being like a journeyman musician who's just constantly, constantly working all the time. Precisely. Which filmmakers, and I, I should say, we should be clear because like film crews work this way all the time, Right. Film crews just work year after year after year on one project, another project, another project. And, you know, you've, you've never heard of most of them, you know, most of even principles, like, like, I don't know how many people in your audience have heard of Janusz Kaminski or somebody like that. Right. Like, Mm -hmm. like really, really good DP, but you know, like most Americans don't know who he is. Right. They'll have heard of Steven Spielberg, not Kaminski. Right. Right. Um, and that's fine, but like he's still making a great living and, and all of his crews that are working with him on movie after movie, making a great living, you know, no problem. Um, but it's interesting that, that people think sort of, I think the, the entertainment industry in general has always had a little bit of that like ultra mega breakout rock star quality to it. You yeah. know, like, like you, you will either become somebody who is working for free essentially, or you'll be a multimillionaire and set for life. Right. But I, I think we've seen, I think the comic model is, is a, the indie comic model is maybe a good one. I also think 
uh, the musician YouTube musician model is a good one too to think about because it enabled people, um, you know, even like like Billie Eilish, I guess, you know, became a, a big star, but you know, she was putting stuff out on YouTube. Well, I always use her as an example. Cool. We we you know, I, I say to people, we live in a world where a seventeen year old girl can can cut an album in her bedroom while her mom serves her cheese sandwiches. Uh, yeah, at, you know, where yeah. before you, like you said, you, you know, if you wanted to be, uh, my dad used to work as a manager in the rock, uh, entertainment world, you know, he managed a lot of bands and, you know, it, it essentially, it, it, it was like the, the record company had to touch you with their magic wand exactly, know, and bless, yeah. bless you. And that was the yeah. only way it was going to happen. And independent, uh, yeah, you know, and and people kind of lamented things like oh, I forget what it's called now. Um, the original was it Napster? Yeah, Napster for sure. Yeah, yeah Napster, Kazaa, or LimeWire, or whatever. Like those first that first generation. I mean, they you know you had you had rock stars you know from like you know putting on ties and begging Congress do something about this. You know, we're just, it's it's yeah. going to destroy our industry, and it and yeah. it ultimately did, but it freed a lot of people to retain and like you said the journeyman yeah. style of doing things is great the difference is with you know with the comic book creators and independent filmmakers is if you're smart if you're not willing to uh if if you think maybe are not so eager to jump at the first distribution deal you're offered or maybe think about your own distribution model where you go directly to your fans because this is what the comic book people do is they produce a comic they don't ask the old model of, of crowdfunding was essentially, hey, you know, give us some money so we can make this. Now what people are doing is they're finding the money to make it first, and it becomes mm-hmm. the crowdfunding becomes give us the money to produce the physical media that we can mail to you. So it's a direct right. line. They right. retain their IP. Maybe they've sold the video on demand rights, but they've retained the physical media. And yeah. and then they um, they they you know they are have a a direct link to their fans which you and I as YouTubers both have a certain amount of fans that we have a, uh you have a lot more than I do but a direct link to people who want to hear what you have to say especially when it comes into in when it when it's in terms of understanding maybe what's wrong with a certain industry that the fans are unhappy and you're able to kind of articulate it for them. And then you say, oh, and by the way, I'm doing it the way you like. uh, And here's my crowdfunding to fulfill it. It's ready to go. And, you know, and then they're eager to get it. So I see, like you said, it's a journeyman thing. And I think in the future it it can be grown into something more. But I think that pursuit of the Hollywood dream might be inhibiting people from yeah um, yeah yeah so i i agree with you i i to to some extent i think that that yeah i i think that people shouldn't be i'll use myself as an example right like again i looked at what it would take to become a a composer for the kinds of projects that like to to get myself just into a position where i could say no consistently you know Mm -hmm. to things that i didn't want to do and only say yes to great projects i was really excited about and honestly, that I'm glad I never took that route because I know that it, that it would it would have been a long shot no matter what. And I did I did okay by the way when I was in L.A. I mean I had a lot of friends who were unemployed. I was never really unemployed for you know more than a month or whatever. And I was still uh, I was still composing stuff. I, I worked for Barry Manilow for a year. I worked as a music editor. I, I was I did pretty well, um, but. I wasn't doing what I wanted to do and I wasn't happy with the kinds of shorts and, and college like sort of USC and UCLA projects that I was working on. I, I, I didn't like what I was making. And for me that the, the, the creative freedom and the, the, the meaning, I mean, you mentioned this earlier, like I care a lot about having a living a life that I am happy with, mm-hmm. that I am proud of, that I feel like has meaning for me. You know, has value as and has. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And 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 so I didn't want to spend the next decade or 15 years or whatever kind of grinding my way through other people's projects that I that I just have to sort of grin and bear because I didn't really enjoy doing it. 
So now, and the, the funny thing is, I then started making projects on my own. I've had an almost unlimited amount of creative freedom. Um, I've been able to write scores for a bunch of the films that I've made and, and still do film scoring. I don't have time now, so I don't do a lot of that today. But I did for a lot of years. We're every every about. documentary that I made, I also scored. Every short like YouTube video or, or like um, video essay or whatever that I made, I would still score. I'd write the music for that too. Um, and, I, and I also got gigs writing for clients that I was really excited about, you know, writing music, uh, producing stuff. There's, a, there's an organization called the Institute for Justice that I'm a big fan of um, that uh, does uh, um, pro bono civil liberties cases and e economic freedom cases for people who are, you know, like one of, one of the stories that I ended up actually doing a documentary about was the first um, the first hair braider, like licensed legal hair braider in Mississippi. That's locked um, out, right? That's locked out. That's one of their cases, one of IJ's cases. And uh, and before that, I'd worked on uh, music for a lot of their case videos. So they do case videos on stuff like the Kilo versus New London um um, eminent domain case, or they had a, a whole bunch of stuff that they did against um, civil asset for forfeiture and police taking people's, basically just taking people's money or cars or whatever, just because they, they had accused them of a crime. Oh, wow. Um, really crazy stuff. And I did, I did a lot of composing for those kinds of things. And I was happier doing that for, you know, a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars a score than I ever would have been working on, you know, a, let's say a, a $200,000 or even a $2 million low budget production, you know, for somebody else. I, I guarantee you, I, I, I was happier and have been just, uh, I've had every, everything that I've wanted to do, I get to do now. Well, this, and, this brings me yeah. kind of to what another thing that I talk about on my channel, which is, you know, it in the past, people really kind of sneer at this phrase, but it's content creation because mm -hmm. people want to say, oh, it's not content, it's art, it's my movie, it's my sure. short film. And I, I understand that. But essentially now we live in a world where um, we are, uh, it, it's it's all melding together for audiences you're not if if you're a filmmaker you're not just uh competing with other filmmakers you're not just competing with uh a television show you're competing you know you're even when it comes to our kids you know it's like they're competing with for our kids attention against like other kids unpackaging toys on youtube oh heck yeah uh, you know we're yeah. we're um we're competing with, you know, my. It comes down to, does my uh, daughter uh, want to watch this Disney animated movie, or my my daughter's into dance? You know, there's free yeah. dance instruction videos, there's yoga videos she likes <laughs> on on the Roku stick, and and so every it's all kind of melted together. Everybody's competing for. Dude, I I went from watching The Shining last night. To going back to because I've been on this kick for the last couple of weeks, world strongest man competition videos on YouTube. Exactly. That, that was where that was the wild swing that I took from Kubrick's like one of his best movies to one of the greatest movies of all time to watching Brian Shaw and Eddie Hall lift like close to a thousand pounds. That's what I. That's what I swung from. And I, I do the same. Easy to do. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'll do comic book review videos and then I'll do an audio book. And we're, and that, that same yeah. thing. Uh, Audible yeah. is a, uh, they're not a sponsor, but it, audio, Audible, if you're listening, I'd be happy to take you as a sponsor. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, essentially, and, and yeah. nobody could have predicted this. I don't think anybody could have predicted this, but by following your own path, by following what was really fulfilling for you and felt had value for you, yeah. you have now become, I mean, Fee's YouTube channel has 2,000, uh, what is that? 2012, we're, what? We're, yeah, 212,000. 212, I was having trouble saying 212,000 
yeah. subscribers and your videos. Yeah. I mean, your most recent video, which is Wonder Woman Got It Wrong, Did You, which I felt was a, a fascinating video with a really good point that I, it was a conclusion that I came to myself, but I would have never been able to articulate in the manner that you did. I thought you did a very great job of that. Uh, 36,360 views as of right now. And that was five days ago. Yeah. So you are- I, I got I got If I'm, if I'm being, being a little bit immodest, the video from the month before is now at 250. So, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I would not have been able to do that. had I kept doing, had I stayed on the path that I was on for sure. And you have, you get to have your own identity as a creator. You get to have yep. your own unique yeah. voice and and yeah. talk about the things that matter and important to you and i think that that's i mean in my mind and this is one of the reasons i wanted to interview you um i mean that's a pinnacle uh, i'm not saying yeah. you couldn't go higher no. but um, no look i i'm i'm gonna keep making stuff as as long as i'm alive there's there's no question i like i i talked to my wife about i mean i work like 80 hours a week i just that's just what i do Right. But um, but I, I do it because I love what I'm doing. I don't ever feel like it's a grind. I don't ever feel like I don't ever wake up in the morning and go like, oh, God, another day of this. Right. Another day of what? Another day of, of managing a, an awesome team with great people and and getting to work with with people who I've just I've watched grow and turn into just incredible artists um, working you know, to write my own YouTube videos and produce the videos that I get to say exactly what I want um, to, you know, tens of thousands, even millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people. Like, what's wrong? Like, there's, I, I have no complaints. Like, I have zero complaints in life. I get to do exactly what I want to do. And, um, and, and, it's, and it's varied and it's diverse. I'm not stuck in one lane necessarily, you know? Like I'm working on a marketing project right now for a big event that we've got coming up, uh, you know, in addition to all this stuff. I do, you know, we do all kinds of stuff. We just started a podcast without a frame too uh, the last couple months and I've been doing podcasts uh, episodes as well. I mean, it's, it's super cool, man. Like, and, and yeah, I want to grow the channel more. I'd like to get to 250 and 300 and 500 and a million, whatever subscribers but um you know i love where i'm at like it's it's great and yeah. you're you're absolutely right if i had stayed in la and continued to try to work my way into a very tightly closed studio system not only would i have probably not gotten to do much of anything that i actually wanted to do you also have to be really, really careful what you say and who you who you talk to and who you're friends with and not friends with and oh, just yeah. political games that you got to play. I didn't want to be a part of any of that, you know, and I'm not. And and I get to do awesome stuff instead, which it, works for me. Again, this is something that I, I want everybody listening to hear in, in every one of my my channels and why I'm, I'm so pleased to have you on the show it it comes down to not only understanding your own value but understanding the what you do value and and working yeah. in service of that and i find that there's a it's kind of like water running down a hill um you know you, you the water kind of finds the canals that it's yeah. meant to travel and and you don't necessarily know where it's going to take you and i think at yeah. this point people are freaking out because things are so unpredictable but for me right it's the most exciting time to be an independent creator because through turmoil, there's opportunity. I mean, even in the midst of World War II, there were <laughs> there were art galleries and 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 theater <laughs> productions. You know, it, it, even yeah. in in like bombed parts of town, people were still looking for those creative outlets. And you know, and, and I think I think if you're actually being entrepreneurial and you're really thinking about what's going to add value to other people's lives, right? What do they what do what do your audiences actually want right now is a really good question to constantly ask yourself. And I actually kind of feel like a lot of the the streaming services and Netflix and and you know and and the studios and whatever aren't actually very good at asking that question. I, I think you see a lot of 
right now, especially, you see a lot of stuff that's really heavily political and really kind of angry and dystopic, you know, dystopian and all this kind of stuff, where I kind of get the sense that people right now would prefer, you know, entertainment. <laughs> they prefer to feel a little bit better about the world right now, a little bit more positive today. And yet you still get just thrown, you know, just awful you know, awful people doing horrible things constantly. <laughs> I, I, I get the impression, sometimes I say this to my wife, I say it feels like people are, are are shoving you up against the wall, hitting you in the face and going, things are awful and we're going to keep beating you until you realize it. <laughs> you yeah, know? that's how it feels to me sometimes too. And I just think, you know, so, like a movie like Palm Springs, for example, came out. And it was one of the bigger movies of the year. It will have been, you know, if we if we were capable of measuring things accurately, I think it would have been one of the bigger movies of the year. Um, it's because Netflix is a black box. We'll never know. Or, or Hulu. Was it Hulu? I don't remember. Anyway, they're all black box. Doesn't matter. The funny thing um, is, is I've never heard of Palm Springs. <laughs> well, so so Palm Springs, uh, it's a great, great little comedy from from uh, Andy Samberg and uh, Christina Milati and or Kristen Milati. It's great and it's funny and it's and it's light and it doesn't it didn't make me, you know, depressed in the middle of like everything that's depressing, you know, in the world. I just I think about stuff like that a little bit. Like it's cool to to go against the like everything is horrible grain also a little bit. Well, this is kind of what I like about exploitation films in general is exploitation films uh like I said using the the actual meaning of the word rather than what people's kind of jump to conclusion of is they're just promising you generally one thing and and they're saying we're gonna have fun with this yes. you know it's yes. gonna if it's gonna be like you know babes on harley davidson's or it's gonna be yeah. monsters my favorite movie right before the pandemic that i took my daughter to and we had a really good time was underwater with Kristen stewart and i did not see that I, i'm actually i'm curious because i the it, I, I've seen a couple trailers. I, I didn't know what I would think about it, so I haven't watched it yet. It's everything it promises to be and nothing more. Uh, and without spoiling it, and I should wrap this up because we're we're going over time, but I am going to have you stick around for the post show for a few minutes. Um, sure. Is sure. Uh, uh, you know it it is uh it's like a knockoff of Alien underwater. Okay. And and sure. people complained that it didn't have enough character development, and I'm going like. But it's an exploitation film. It's, it's it's telling you, you know, do you want fifteen minutes of getting to know these characters before the monsters eat them all, or or do you like let's just get to the monsters? And we, my daughter and I, had a really good time with it. And I think sometimes people, like you said, they're so they want to be high art, or they want to show you the how great yeah. they are with the cinematography or something like that. They forget to entertain you and. Um, one of my favorite sayings, uh, and this comes, I'm stealing this from one of the comic book YouTubers who does crowdfund his comics all the time. He says, don't let great be the enemy of good. Um, yeah. You know, and, and I think that, uh, yeah, like I said, you we're kind of being hit over the head. I, I'm a big Ray Bradbury fan, and I, and I started to see the new Fahrenheit 451, and I went, this isn't, this isn't Bradbury at all. This is, you know, what people think Bradbury is without really paying attention to him because they have already decided on a worldview that they're going to present. And my thing is, oh, look at that. I'm, I'm taking over your interview. <laughs> but, um, no. I, my thing is just, you know, understand what your values are, your core values yeah. are, and uh, don't preach them. Just ex if, if you want to do something with them on film, just explore them on film but you know uh don't don't feel like they have to be what your movie's about just start from there and you'll probably do something that's good um so anyway that's all i'm going to say about that but before we wrap is there any last uh because i, I do want to talk a bit more uh with you uh, uh, about your work on uh for fee but we'll do that mm -hmm. in the post show but it okay. um I, I will encourage people to check out the uh, Fee YouTube channel. It is truly wonderful, especially if you do want to be a successful filmmaker and business person at the same time. Uh, so uh, take it Thanks, away, man. Sean. What, what would yeah. you Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, check out check out the YouTube. Uh, it's uh, youtube.com slash fee online. Um, the, the show is out of frame. You can find probably find it at this point just by searching YouTube. It's not too hard. Um, and also check out our we have some featured channels on the on the on the main channel, like the out of frame behind the scenes podcast, which not a whole lot of people have listened to yet. And I'm biased, but I think it's pretty good. And I think a lot of people would like some of these discussions, especially if you're a fan of this show, you'd probably like our podcast as well. So I'll, I'll leave it with those. Those those are probably the two main things. All right. Well, Sean Malone from Fee.org's Foundation for Economic Education. Out of Frame is brilliant. Check it out. Thank you so much for being on the show. Stick around. We are going to the post show on my Patreon channel. Uh, thanks again, Sean. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>